the Soul King is the subject of many Bleach criticisms. For such an important figure in both the world and the narrative, people don't like the fact he receives such a small amount of focus within the main story of Bleach. And to make matters worse, we receive incredibly crucial bits of exposition in the Can't Fear Your Own World light novels that contextualise so many aspects of his character, aspects that are supposedly lacking in the manga. But the key word there is supposedly. I am of the belief that the Soul King is not just perfectly written, but perfectly written within the the manga alone. We absolutely do not need the novel material to understand everything he brings to this story. It's definitely nice to have things put clearly into words and strictly defined like they are in the novels, but it's absolutely not necessary. Most of the information we receive there is clearly implied within the Thousand Year Blood War, and most importantly, Kubo's style of writing is pretty much the furthest thing from on the nose. Spoon feeding information like that through heavy handed, unnatural exposition would not be in line with how he typically writes Bleach, especially given the fact that the Soul King is an incredibly enigmatic existence that characters within the story barely understand even those closest to him like Ichibe and Yuhaba. In fact, I think it's reasonable to say that we, as readers, can extrapolate far more about the Soul King than the majority of the characters within the story can. We can understand him better than they do by virtue of understanding the story being told. Most of the Soul King's writing is deeply tethered in subtext and other implicit means of storytelling which obscures it to some degree. Information regarding his function, his individual character, his history and so forth may not be clear at first glance, but they're hard to miss when you're really looking for them. Which is exactly what I intend to accomplish with this video, to take a closer look at all the content we receive for the Soul King in the 686 chapters of Bleach, compare that with the light novel material, whilst delivering an analytical breakdown of the Soul King, explaining his thematic role and what he brings to the story as a whole. As you can tell, we have a lot to discuss, so please get comfortable and I hope you enjoy the video. Bleach is a story predicated on existentialism, exploring the human condition as it pertains to life and death. Overcoming the grief one feels when losing a loved one, overcoming the natural fear that all living beings feel when faced with the finite, and embracing the little life we do have is just a few of the threads you can find in Bleach concerning these ideas. And in the centre of it all, both literally and figuratively, is the Reo, the Soul King. Down to his very name, the importance of this figure is incredibly obvious. The soul as a concept is the primary instrument through which Kubo explores almost every facet of Bleach, from the thematic framework, to the characters, to the world building. It is the very essence of an individual, dictating the flow of the cosmos which itself can be best described as a circulation of souls between the separate realms, swirling life and death. The soul defines the several different magic systems belonging to the different races. The soul is what links every single individual in the cosmos as spiritual existences. And it is the subject of arguably Bleach's most important idea, the heart. Not the organ that pumps blood around the body as Urukyora would say, but rather one's very spirit, interchangeably used with the term soul in Japanese. The kokoro is the specific term used, which doesn't serve a single definition, but rather signifies a concept that encompasses various definitions. The kokoro refers to a person's cumulative collective conscience, everything they've ever thought and felt all at once, their very essence, something invisible, symbolic and conceptual, but simultaneously ever present. It cannot be seen, but it is definitely felt by every single character in this story, which naturally makes the Soul King, by virtue of just his name, the ultimate expression of this idea. If the Soul is the linchpin of Bleach's narrative on a thematic level, the same can be said for the Soul King, who is also the linchpin of Bleach's narrative on a structural level. He is the centerpiece of the major conflicts in both the pre-time skip and post-time skip, the being that both the ultimate villains in Aizen and Yuhaba detest for very similar reasons, the nature of his existence. An omnipotent, omniscient god who supposedly rules over the universe when in truth he is a limbless corpse trapped in a crystal, residing in a perpetual suspended state of both life and death, at the juncture of the two points in existence that define this story. A being with all the power in the world who lacks the agency to do anything with it. That is the unbearable vacancy of Heaven's Throne that Aizen wished to topple. That is the endless humiliation Yuhaba wished to end. 
But how on earth does an individual who has no equal, who can see all futures, who is unparalleled in power, find himself in such a shameful condition? We are introduced to the concept of the Soul King in chapter 223, when Yamamoto shares Aizen's true objective. We're told that the Soul Society has its own royal family that has never been seen, and that the Reo is a symbolic yet revered figure in the Soul Society. As you can tell, people outside of Squad Zero don't know much of the truth at all. There is no actual royal family, just the Soul King himself, who we are introduced to in chapter 519. The Shinigami are indoctrinated with the belief that they are maintaining the crushing wheel of life and death, which is guided by an infallible power. If fate is a millstone, then we are the ones who make it turn. These are Rukia's words in the prologue chapter concerning the nature of the universe and the role of the Shinigami in preserving balance, as she submits to the institution she exists within. When we first see the Reio, he appears to have a humanoid figure and resides within a crystal. His eyes are easily the most striking aspect of this design and given much focus in his introductory spread. We do not see the Reio after this brief moment for another 90 chapters when we finally receive his first real and also last scene of the entire manga, his death following the battle between the pinnacle of the Quincy and the pinnacle of Shinigami. Let's take a look at all the hints we receive in this stretch of chapters. Upon first arriving at the Soul King Palace, we get a short but insightful conversation between Yuhaba and Yugaram. Yugaram states that he understands how his majesty must feel, to which Yuhaba responds, I'm not feeling a shred of emotion from looking at this decaying grave. Yugaram suspecting that Yuhaba feels some type of way upon reaching what we have been led to believe is the residence of the King of Shinigami makes it very clear that not everything is as it seems. Why would the father and leader of the Quincy sympathize with the leader of his ultimate enemy? Ichibe entrusts Ichigo with protecting the Soul King. His body language throughout this entire sequence is rather questionable. He looks at the ground as he begs Ichigo to stop Yuhaba. He is shown from behind so we don't get an actual close look at his facial expression. There seem to be some deep dark secrets Ichibe is keeping to himself. He outright states that the Soul King is the key to the world. If he dies, the Seireite, the world of the living, Hueko Mundo, all of it will disappear. This is in line with Urahara's words following Aizen's defeat, who stated that without the Reio, the Soul Society would fall apart. The king is the keystone. Without the keystone, the entire structure would crumble. That is simply the way of this world. The Soul King is established as a necessary cornerstone for the greater good of the entire universe, the symbol of balance. Not a ruler or a figurehead for just the Soul Society, but for the whole world. We cut to the Reio who is being pierced through the chest by Yuhaba. Once again, his eyes are his most striking feature, and this time his silhouette within the crystal doesn't appear to have any legs. Yuhaba calls the Soul King his father who has seen the future, and this is where things get really interesting. Whether Yuhaba is the biological child of the Soul King or just a symbolic child is yet to be known. The point is, he views him as his father, the one who came before him. I'm aware the Thousand Year Blood War anime adaptation is adding to Yuhaba's backstory with things like the implication of Yuhaba's mother being inspired by the Virgin Mary in the first scene of season 2, which is an idea I personally subscribe to. It's consistent with the Christian references that characterize Yuhaba, but that's a topic for another day. As Yuhaba is the father of the Quincy and the son of the Soul King, the implication that all Quincy originally stem from the Soul King is introduced. The line about Reo seeing the future is also crucial. He seems to possess the Almighty just like his son, the ability that can be best described as omni precognition. The ability that allows Yuhaba to see everything that is to occur from the present moment into the far flung future. He can know everything that lies within his his gaze. He doesn't see a single linear future, but rather can observe all possible futures like grains of sand, and can thus act according to that knowledge, to prepare for any circumstance. That distinction is very crucial, as a single linear future rejects the possibility of that future being changed, whereas multiple possible futures allows for that to be the case. The devil is in the details though. The Soul King's eyes each have four pupils, one more than Yuhaba who has three pupils by the end of his battle against against Ichibe. Yuhaba's eyes gaining an extra pupil is treated like a big deal in chapter 610, which indicates that Reo's four pupils are an implication of even greater power than Yuhaba's almighty. What could the Reo possibly see that surpasses Yuhaba's ability to observe all possible futures? To me, the most likely case
case is that time itself is a flat circle to the rail. The future has already happened, the past is still going to happen. Everything happens simultaneously in the gaze of the Soul King. This is supported by the chapter sketches which depict the Soul King as a sphere or a grain of sand that signifies fate. The crushing wheel of fate or the crushing wheel of time, these things kind of go hand in hand. To make matters even more interesting, Panida possesses two pupils, Mimihagi possesses one pupil, and Gerard's eyes have no pupils, Panida being the left hand of the Soul King, Mimihagi being the right hand, and Gerard being the heart. We'll talk about these different aspects of Reo in more detail in just a few moments. Yuhaba calls the Reo an imperfect god who is unable to escape even in a moment like this. He then goes on to say that he shall bring an end to the Reo's endless humiliation. No, perhaps the Reo already foresaw this very day. This further suggests, if not outright confirms, that the Reo possesses the Almighty just like Yuhaba. And it is very clearly shown here that the Reo is a limbless, humanoid figure. He has no arms, he has no legs, and thus he has no agency. Just an observer with an Almighty gaze trapped in a crystal, a position considered humiliating by his son. Ichigo finally arrives at Ryo's residence to see Yuhaba standing in front of him with his sword wedged in the chest of the keystone. This time, the Quincy King's eyes are brought into focus. The eyes he calls proof of a true Quincy, which says a lot about the Soul King who shares those same eyes. Ichigo immediately dashes to pull the blade out, and then it happens. Go on, pull it out. I know you can do it. Pull that sword out and bring the Soul Society down with your own hands. The framing of this scene almost makes it seem as if the Reo is the one verbalizing Yuhaba's words, which I believe to be a very intentional decision. And thus, Ichigo kills the Soul King, slicing the crystal he resides in clean in half, something else that Yuhaba foresaw. The Quincy blood inside Ichigo will never accept the Soul King's existence, and immediately following this, we witness the crumbling of the cosmos. A massive earthquake extends across the universe. Yuzu and Kadin in the human world are feeling the effects of the Reo's death in a distant dimension. That alone should communicate fairly well the role of the Soul King. He's not just a symbolic cornerstone for the world, he is a literal cornerstone. His existence maintains the equilibrium of the universe, but he has no agency. And that is exactly what makes his existence so interesting. The Soul Society begins to crumble, vanishing from existence. Urahara notices that this must mean the Reo has been killed, which means every realm of existence will cease to exist. Then Yuhaba tells us the Reo was created to stabilize the Soul Society, where massive numbers of Kompaku pass through. Keyword there being created. Now that it is gone, not just the Soul Society, but everything connected to it will collapse. And if you've watched my world building series, you'll know that everything is connected to it. The Dangai, the Garganta, every realm of existence. The entire universe will crumble at the hands of Ichigo. Orihime's ability to reject and reverse phenomena is rendered useless when she tries to return the Reo to his previous state. Another interesting detail, given that her ability has previously been described as a rejection of divine law. Yuhaba claims resurrecting Reo is impossible, regardless of what powers you use, and thus Ukitake enters the fold. He says that he will take Reo's place, begins to cast an incantation, and a black shadowy figure emerges from his body. A god that is said to be the enshrined right arm of Reo that fell from the heavens long ago. And so Ukitake sacrifices his life to replace the Reo and serve as the cornerstone of the universe just like him, through the Reo's right arm that had long since merged with him. Mimihagi traverses upwards to the Soul King's dimension, latches onto the split crystal, and Yuhaba immediately notices that this must be a part of the Reo. He notices this because Mimihagi doesn't reflect on his eye. Yuhaba can intervene with all futures reflected on his eyes. He showcases this when he breaks Ichigo's Bankai in the future, and manifests that future into the present. The Reo is the one thing whose future Yuhaba cannot intervene with, or even see, as the Reo is not reflected on his not so almighty eyes. The fact Mimihagi, who is a part of Reo, is getting in the way of Yuhaba's plans absolutely infuriates him. He asks him why? Why are you getting in the way? Are you suddenly feeling an attachment to the Soul Society you've been protecting? All of this further points to the implication that Reo has ties to the Quincy and originally didn't have ties to the Shinigami, or at least that is what Yuhaba believes. Yuhaba justifies this to himself as an odd occurrence, and states that Reo's will no longer dwells in an arm that's been 
ripped off. Heavy emphasis on ripped off. Yuhaba goes in to destroy Mimihagi alongside the Reo but is stopped by Ichigo who wants to protect the entire universe. Ichigo reiterates his sense of agency and free will, stating that having Yuhaba's blood inside him is not going to make him do what Yuhaba wants him to. And again, Yuhaba states that whether or not Ichigo will do as he wishes is up to those eyes of his. He tells Ichigo that their wills are connected by virtue of the shared blood flowing inside of them. Mimihagi attempts to attack Yuhaba who questions its motives once more. Why would the Ryo's right arm want to consume its own child? He notes that Mimihagi is now far inferior to him and then absorbs Mimihagi through his hand and decides to take everything that once belonged to the Soul King. He fires a beam of darkness down to the Seireite and takes on a new appearance. Mimihagi's will has been shifted to Yuhaba's now that he has been absorbed and these tiny dark creatures with a single eye begin to pass through Yuhaba's body. Yugaram tells Lily Barrow to calm down and that these creatures won't harm him as they are a torrent of Reo's power and Reo's true enemy are the Shinigami. The creatures descend to the Seireite and begin to attack members of the Gote 13. Yuhaba has now completely absorbed Mimihagi and the Soul King. His first act as a being overflowing with power is to reinvent the Quincy's nation, reshaping the royal palace into the Varvelt or the castle of the true world. Now that I have done a fairly extensive recap of the events in these chapters, let's quickly go over the key details. The Reo is the father of Yuhaba. Whether that's literal or symbolic is yet to be known, but he has clear ties to the Quincy. Yuhaba considers the Soul King Palace a rotting grave and the Soul King's current status a humiliation. Yugaram believes the Soul King's true enemy are the Shinigami. Yuhaba cannot fathom why Mimihagi would interfere and stop him from destroying the balance of the cosmos. Reo has the ability to see the future like Yuhaba, the Almighty, and presumably this is an even more advanced ability than Yuhaba's since he has an extra pupil. The implications of these chapters, even without taking the light novels into consideration, tell a dark story that underpins not just the Thousand Year Blood War but the entire story of Bleach. It is heavily implied that the Reo was mutilated and placed into a crystal by the ancestors of the same Shinigami who function as protagonists of the manga. They did this to create the world as it is now, using the Reo as the cornerstone for the current fixed shape of the cosmos, swirling life and death that they maintain as they please. But who gave them that right? They fashioned this universe to suit themselves and Yuhaba exists to enact vengeance for his father, fighting to return the world into what it once was, before life and death were created, to reshape the composition of the cosmos into a single almighty realm as it was when his father was conjured into existence. He fights to punish the Shinigami for their ancient sins, as the ultimate representation of cycles by striking them with karma. What's especially important to understand is that Yuhaba did not intend to merge with the Soul King in this stretch of chapters. The intervention of Mimihagi was a future that could not reflect on his eyes, as a part of the Soul King who is the only entity in existence that cannot be seen by Yuhaba's almighty. By merging with the crystal containing the head and torso of its its host, Mimihagi halts the destruction of the universe. Yohaba is forced to consume the Soul King's head and torso, which turns himself into the new cornerstone of the universe, rendering him the symbol of balance. In a way, he has become the Soul King, and the Soul King lives within him. In a very poetic, ironic fashion, Yohaba became the very thing he wished to destroy and began to look for other ways to reshape the cosmos, which isn't something he can't do, but it does require a lot more effort than simply having killed the Reo and allowed the realms to merge. Mimihagi's intrusion threw a wrench into the cogs of fate. The Can't Fear Your Own World light novels distinctly explain the creation of the universe and the original sin of the Shinigami ancestors. Sometime in the last million years, the world of the living, Soul Society, and Hueco Mundo were not separate realms of existence. They existed as a singular realm in a time known as the Primordial Age. The only exception being Hell, which has always been separate, though that in of itself is a conversation for another day. During this age, all of creation was in a state of ambiguity. Ambiguity. There was neither life nor death. Progression and regression flickered to and fro. Swaying and swaying slowly, this waning and waxing world waited for a hundred million years to cool down. Eventually, hollows became a part of the circulation of souls. This in particular is extremely interesting. The fact that there was a circulation of souls prior to the fixed shapes of life and death. But before long, hollows began devouring humans and the circulation ceased, which threatened all of existence. All of the devoured souls came together to form a gigantic hollow. 
the first ever menos. This is clearly inspired by the scientific concept of entropy, the degradation of the matter and energy in the universe to an ultimate state of inert uniformity. This is theorized to be the general trend of our universe towards its inevitable death. Matter and energy in the case of Bleach referring to Reishi, spiritual particles, which were consumed by the first ever menos as it expanded and ultimately became the host of countless souls. The world became completely still, and then a new life came came into being. As if the world itself naturally rejected the Menos, this new being destroyed it and turned it into sands of Reishi that were later used to create Huacomundo, and thus circulation began once again. This new being is the one we now know as the Soul King. Others with special powers also appeared, however the Soul King stood out. His powers were the closest thing to absolute omnipotence and omniscience. As the Soul King continued to protect the world from the Hollows by killing them, the world began to slowly sink into chaos. After all, the Hollows had become part of the circulation which demanded their existence for the sustenance of the world, an almost one-to-one -one copy of the Shinigami Quincy conflict that would take place a million years later. Of course, those who did not find the state of affairs agreeable are the ancestors of those same Shinigami. There were five of them. Although nowhere near as much as the Soul King, they were incredibly powerful. These were the original founders of the five great noble houses, including the Shiba family, which would ultimately fall from this position of nobility. Each of these five individuals had different motives. The Tsunayashiro ancestor was driven by fear, fear that the Soul King's power could someday be used against them. The ancestor of the fifth, currently unknown clan, was driven by pragmatism. He wished to create a world that would serve as the lid to cover up the pit we now know as hell. The Kuchki ancestor was driven by a desire for institution, believing that a new order was necessary to solidify the world. The Shihoin ancestor was driven by evolution, believing it was necessary to form a larger circulation to advance this stagnant world. And the Shiba ancestor was driven by empathy. They wanted to explore the path of purification for hollows rather than destruction, since they too had hearts. And these widely varying motives strangely led to the same goal in the end, to split the world. A world of order, a world of implementation, and a paradise of sand where souls from each side could end up in their main goal being to create the forms of life and death, and thus a clear separation between the world of the living and the world of the dead. And in order to turn this goal into a reality, they required the power of the one who transcended everything. Reo himself, who they tied up and sealed within a crystal. Using his powers of the Almighty as the keystone, the foundation of a new world was formed. Soul Society, the world of the living, and Huecomundo. Hell had always existed, and thus the universe as it is in the current day was was born, life and death were separated, the cycle of souls ushered in a new era. Of course, it wasn't that simple. The Shiba ancestor interjected and offered themselves a sacrifice. This is perfectly in line with the actions of their descendants. Ichigo, Ishin, and even Ganju demonstrate their sacrificial nature on several occasions. Some short time later, the Tsunayashiro ancestor consumed by fear took things a step even further, suggesting that they should mutilate the Reo to ensure that he could never turn against them. Though hesitatingly, the others agreed and placed the Soul King in a state of existence that cannot be considered alive or dead. And then as time progressed, the ones who managed the Soul Society came to be known as Shinigami. We learn all of this through Ichibei's conversation with the rest of Squad Zero, and while we can take most of it as fact, there are definitely missing fragments to this, and Ichibei is not the most trustworthy. So take it all with a grain of salt. We also learn in the novels that Fullbringers are deeply tied to the Soul King. Within their souls, they contain a fragment of Ryo, which is why they're attacked by hollows within their mother's womb. This is something tethered within the composition of their souls prior to their births as humans, in a very similar fashion to the Quincy. Fullbringers contain a piece of the Ryo within their soul, and Quincy contain a piece of Yuhaba within their souls. This explains why Ryuken tells Orihime that herself, Chad, and Uryu are in a similar category, especially considering the ties between the Ryo and Yuhaba. This connection to the Soul King explains why some of the Fullbringers have ridiculously hacked powers, like Tsukushima's ability to manipulate the past and essentially rewrite 
write history or Orihime's ability to reject divine law. Giriko can form contracts with God, Yukio can create dimensions, Riruke can move souls into one another. Their powers are truly ridiculous and this connection to the Soul King justifies just where they came from. But there are exceptions like Chad and Ginjo whose abilities are rather simple and can be best described as power amplification. This is because the real power of the Soul King fragment doesn't just manifest in a Fullbringer's unique ability but rather the fundamentals of the power system itself that all of them share. The ability to manipulate souls which resides in absolutely everything. This is best seen through Ora Michibane in Can't Fear Your Own World who has no unique Fullbring ability. She contains the Saketsu of the Soul King within her, the organ present in the bodies of Shinigami which boosts the spiritual energy of a Shinigami. The Hakusui works in tandem with the Saketsu and creates the spiritual energy which is boosted by the latter. These are the organs Byakuya destroyed in the first arc of the series, sealing Ichigo's powers. Even without a unique Fullbring ability, Ora is able to manipulate souls to such a ridiculous degree, one could call her the most impressive Fullbringer. She creates a replica of the Soul King Palace, manipulating the physics of the area and thus allowing these cities to float in the sky, such as the power of one who contains a fragment of the Soul King within them, the power to manipulate souls which reside in absolutely everything. And lastly, the novels explain that one of the nails of the Soul King was contained within Rangiku's soul which is why Aizen required it for the creation of the Hogyoku. The reason I wanted to go over all this novel exposition is to really draw the line between the information we receive in the manga and the information we receive in the novels. Everything about the Soul King, the original sin, the ancestors of the five noble families, the primordial age can all be inferred within the manga as I previously outlined when going through his final scene. Yuhaba believed the Soul King was betrayed. He referred to his residence as a decaying grave. He was confused when Mimihagi interjected. All of these things paint the picture of the Reio as a Quincy, but as the literal cornerstone of the world that is connected to every single realm of existence, it is further implied that he is a being of every race like Ichigo. We can also assume that before the Soul Society was created, which has a million year history, that every single realm was one. That is the world Yuhaba wished to create, or more accurately, recreate. If simply killing the Soul King will combine all worlds, then that more than implies that prior to the Soul King's existence, all worlds were combined, and it was through his power that they were separated. This is further substantiated by Yuhaba's effortless reishi manipulation, which allowed him to reconstruct the Soul King Palace into his own castle of the true world. Since his powers are implied to be very similar to the Reos, just imagine this at a much larger scale, reconstructing the entire cosmos. And if the mutilated Reo is being kept in a crystal, in the heavens of Soul Society, it's also implied that the ones responsible for this are the Shinigami. That is why Yugaram refers to them as Reo's true enemy, as he understandably considers this vile act to be worthy of antagonism. Of course, the Soul King is far more complicated than just that, but Yugaram and even Yohaba could not have known this. And we can take this further by implying that the ones responsible are the ancestors of the noble families. Where did this nobility come from, if not their role in history and the creation of this society? The only real information the novel provides is the individual motives of the five ancestors, as well as the information regarding Fullbringers. And while those things are fantastic to have, they're absolutely not necessary to gain a clear understanding of the Reo. They're also somewhat alluded to in the manga, but that would be bordering on incredibly loose interpretations that may just be a product of hindsight sight on my part, so I'll refrain from trying to justify that with scenes from the manga. Kubo stated that he didn't explicitly include all of this novel information in the manga because we're reading the story about Ichigo and the Shinigami of the current day. He didn't want to muddy the story's focus by taking away from that and honestly I'm grateful for it. All of this information is there in the manga when you really look for it. We begin with the Reo's two arms. The right arm Mimihagi who governs over stagnation and stillness, and the left arm Panaida who governs over evolution and advancement. These two arms are diametrically opposed in more ways than one. Mimihagi sided with the Shinigami to maintain the status quo and current shape of the universe. It is very likely that out of every piece of the Soul King, only Mimihagi was capable of intruding Yuhaba's plans and preventing the collapse of the cosmos, as he governs over stillness and can thus essentially freeze the process of the collapsing worlds. Naida sides with the polar opposite of Shinigami, 
the Quincy. In fact, he's the most vocal out of every Stern Ritter with regards to his identity as a Quincy. He's proud of his allegiances and claims to have always been a Quincy. Whilst Panida is surprisingly outward regarding his motives, Mimihagi is a silent agent of far more ambiguous motives. He doesn't have a single line of dialogue, and the closest we receive to an inkling of personality is this creepy smile, which is a feat in of itself considering he has no mouth. Then there is the obvious left and right symbolism present in both of these arms. Many cultures have this dichotomy of the left and right sides, which you probably don't need me to tell you. There is obviously far more to this, but for the sake of this video, it is as simple as the left being associated with evil and the right being associated with good. Mimihagi's power of stagnation is best seen in their relationship with Ukitake. They saved his life with this power by essentially freezing his incurable illness. The illness never went away and can be seen in the Battle of Kain's death, but it stopped progressing any further. It stagnated. The story of Mimihagi is incredibly ambiguous, but I'd like to think of it as one of free will over fate. Mimihagi spent a very long time with the Shinigami, developing their own will, which is bolstered by their experiences. The hand came to care for them, even above the will of its own body, if we can believe Yuhaba and Yugara's assumption of the Reo being the enemy of Shinigami. A wonderful parallel can be drawn between Mimihagi and old man Zangetsu, the piece of Yuhaba's soul within Ichigo that came to care for him, a representation of how time and experience could have made Yuhaba a different man. On the opposite end of the scale, we have Panida in chains. They fight a holy war alongside the rest of the Quincy to bring back the world of old and rid all of existence from fear and death. Many interesting contradictions are present within both of Reo's arms. Penaida is associated with the inauspicious left that is the furthest thing from holy whilst being one of the key members in a holy army. Mimihagi is associated with the right, the direct opposite, and they side with the ones who mutilated and humiliated their host body, the closest thing to a god in Bleach's cosmos. We can even see this in the black and white dichotomy present in the dress wear of the respective of armies. The Shinigami don black robes as opposed to the Quincy's white clothing. We can think of the world Yuhaba wishes to create as a perfect, deathless utopia. And we know very well what Kubo thinks about the concept of perfection. Mayuri equates perfection to stagnation, stillness. It leaves no room for evolution or improvement. It's not something to be sought after as it removes the possibility of betterment. Every protagonist in Bleach who achieves personal enlightenment are the proof in the pudding. They fight to maintain the current composition of the cosmos, imperfections included, despite the fact many of them are grieving the deaths of loved ones. They choose a world where that grief can still crop up and come to bite them, rejecting Yuhaba's deathless utopia in favour of a world with the potential for evolution and development. Ironic that Mimihagi, who governs over stagnation, fights for this cause whilst Panida, who governs over evolution, fights for the perfect yet stagnant world. These contradictions speak to the Soul King as the ultimate representation of balance. Both sides sides of this conflict exist within him. Both sides of this conflict are personified by him in the form of his arms, and both of his arms represent both stagnation and evolution. Besides Panida, the only other member of the Schutzstaffel to not have had special powers directly bestowed upon them by Yuhaba is Gerard Valkyrie. This is because much like Panida, they are representative of a piece of the Soul King, the heart, which I previously described as arguably the single most important idea you can find in Bleach. Despite being associated with this all important idea, Gerard is most definitely the least developed piece of the Soul King, which honestly just makes him all the more interesting to me. I am sure there are elements of his character I have yet to comprehend, which is why I'll be paying close attention to him once the anime adaptation reaches his most prominent material. The only time Gerard ever verbalized this connection to the Soul King is when activating his Volstandig, which is aptly named Ashtonic, God's power. He then proclaims himself to be the noble warrior of God, the one who swings his sword for God even in death. As the heart is an obvious metaphorical representation of one's might and purpose, their reason for being, we can attach this characterization of a persevering, powerful warrior to the Reo himself, who fought nobly against the many hollows who threatened the world in the primordial age. And of course, it is very fitting for the heart of the Soul King to be able to materialize miracles. The heart wants what it wants, after all. Gremi is all but confirmed to be the literal brain of the Soul King. He's not like Gerard or Ukitake who contain a piece of the Soul King within them and function as host bodies, but more like Panida and Mimihagi, the actual piece itself. 
Gurmi's body is materialized by the brain. Through his power of the visionary, he can materialize anything he imagines. Gurmi can have absolutely everything under the sun, but fails to hold on to those things by virtue of his innumerable flaws. Every single one of the Soul King's internal organs were gorged out. Every one of his limbs were dismembered. The left arm, Panida. The right arm, Mimihagi. The heart within Gerard, the brain Gremi, the Saketsu within Aura, one of his nails within Rangiku and now the Hogyoku. But what about the legs? What about the lungs? What about the kidney or the liver? What about the Hakusui, the chain of fate? It's interesting to think about and the possibilities are endless. The reason I went to such lengths to cover each and every one of the Soul King's pieces is because although they have wills of their own and exist as individuals separate from the Soul King, they are still bound to him as their origin. If you have any theories or potential candidates for any of the unknown limbs and organs, let me know in the comment section, I'd absolutely love to read that. My current theories are that Baragan could potentially have one of the Ryo's lungs, and that Ichigo could have the chain of fate. I most likely will be making a video on that theory in the near future, so make sure to stay tuned for that. Finally though, we reach the most exciting portion of the video, taking absolutely everything I've covered thus far in hopes of providing a comprehensive, thematic analysis of Bleach's Soul King. As one would expect, we don't have much to go off of when it comes to analysing the Soul King's personality and motives. This is a character with zero lines of dialogue who shows up just twice in the entire story, yet still there are an infinite number of ways to tackle this. As the most important figure in the world, the linchpin of the universe itself, there are countless things that feed into the Soul King's functional role within the narrative. We can dissect his character by viewing everything around his character, as that's where his true significance lies. Viewing the Reo as a concept instead of an individual character, and asking questions about his function in the story, both narratively and thematically, can help make the picture of his existence clearer. Why did Kubo give this all-important character such little screen time? Why did the Soul King allow the ancestors of the noble families to seal him? What does the Soul King's inclusion in the story do for the main ideas explored, from existentialism to ideological discourse to transcendence? Balance is the single most important thing necessary for the universe to function. It hinges upon balance. Without balance, the world will crumble. The Shinigami maintained balance and that was decided by their ancestors, who fashioned the universe, using the power of the Soul King and placing him in the centre of it all. We can think of the Soul King, at least conceptually, as a creation of the Shinigami, but in reality he was created by a greater will, conjured into existence. The conditions in the primordial age and the high concentration of Reishi in the atmosphere was extreme, and so, incredibly powerful individuals were spawning into existence, as if the world itself was fighting back against the first ever Menos. And thus the Reo is a product of necessity, his existence is a requirement for the sustenance of the universe. In a sense, his existence itself is cyclical, much like the structure of the story itself. I go into extreme depth about this in my Ichigo analysis, but the crux of this interpretation is that Bleach as a story, deeply concerned with the concept of fate and fighting against that fate through sheer force of will, is littered with cycles. The concept of cycles by definition implies the lack of free will. Those caught in it are there without choice, they perpetrate whatever it is they were victims of, creating more victims and in turn more perpetrators. These cycles of pain and suffering are primarily expressed through grief, as the ultimate cycle is that of life and death. This is evidenced by the way Bleach is split into two halves that parallel, mirror and complement one another, and again at the centre of it all is the Soul King, the being responsible for the fixed shapes of life and death, who himself exists at the juncture between life and death, the being whose existence is responsible for the major conflict spurred on by both main villains in these two halves of the story. The Reo did not resist against the five ancestors, he allowed them to seal and mutilate him for reasons we can never know for sure. But we can infer that this choice to not fight back is connected to the events of the Thousand Year Blood War, which he foresaw since all the way back then. His death at the hands of Kurosaki Ichigo, the boy closest to him in the entire cosmos, even more so than his own son. A candidate to replace him as the cornerstone of the universe a confluence of all races whom Ichibei planned to use as a contingency plan if the Reo met his demise. Through his battle against Yuhaba, the respective philosophies of both sides in the Thousand Year Blood War are represented in the pinnacle of their establishments. As the one to have named most things in the Soul Society, Ichibei governs over history itself, fighting to maintain the current foundation of the cosmos as a key contributor to its creation. Yuhaba fights to avenge his father, for the potential of a new world, the future, by returning the world to 
what it once was and ridding existence of the fear of death. By simply killing the Soul King, Yuhaba wished to destroy balance and merge the separated realms. But the intrusion of Mimihagi, the right arm of the Soul King, prevented this from happening. They merged with the Soul King preventing his death by way of stagnation and essentially forcing Yuhaba to consume them. From that moment until the end of the series, Yuhaba is the acting Soul King, the cornerstone of the cosmos, the figurehead of balance, and the Soul King exists within him. Reo functions as the benchmark for the very idea of ideology and bleach, while also having every aspect of his necessary existence be in contradiction to that same idea. By that I mean the Soul King is a being who is completely removed from sense and thought, which is the basis for any ideology or belief. A being whose existence as the linchpin of the cosmos was formed to remove human ideological discourse and struggle. He was created as a solution to the literal singularity of the universe a million years ago. Yet everything surrounding his existence acts in direct contradiction to that, and every single person who acts on behalf of him directly contradicts his purpose as the senseless instinctual keystone. There are characters like Ichibe and Yamamoto who, while serving under the concept of the Soul King, act on specific and authoritative ideology, who claim that these beliefs are on behalf of him, while he himself is completely removed from the capability of having any ideology. This also extends into those on the opposite end of the spectrum, those like Aizen and Yuhaba who act directly against the Soul King, planning to destroy and dethrone him. They act in opposition to the authoritative ideology that those who claim to fight on behalf of the Soul King hold. They hold ideals of their own, and Reo is at the centre of them all, as the blank state whose existence is embellished by the ideals of others. He had no role to play in becoming this figure. This marriage of contradictions that define the Soul King begins with his design, possessing an almighty variant superior to even Yuhaba's, yet lacking the agency to do anything with that foresight. A senseless shell of a man with nothing but an almighty eye, the observer of fate itself, sealed within a crystal. Spiritual enlightenment is the highest position one can reach in Bleacher's narrative. It is advocated for by Kubo and oftentimes serves as the conclusion for a protagonist's character arc. Ichigo, Rukia, Renji, Byakuya, Toshiro, Mayuri, Shunsui, the list goes on. The entire Thousand Year Blood War arc is rooted in exploring the nature of expression, to be true to yourself and accept yourself wholly despite any fears you may have, and to live your life according to that person. Interestingly, the Soul King is a being unable to express himself through regular means. He cannot verbalise his thoughts. It is implied he has no thoughts given the fact his brain was removed from his skull. He cannot act, he cannot move forward, he has no arms, no legs, a senseless figurehead robbed of all agency. And yet still his will persists. Still he has without doubt the most influence on the narrative. He has literal entire separate existences that act as his form of expression, oftentimes assuming his own will and acting for it though the degree to which that is the case is an uncertainty. Not just for us readers, but for characters within the story. As Reo doesn't just exist for us to better understand Kubo's vision, but for the characters themselves to appreciate the necessity of hardship in striving for self-actualization. The nature of transcendence in Bleach is predicated on the idea of individual, singular expression. What individuals do to express themselves through their words and actions. To be the best person you can possibly be is to accept accept yourself and live according to who you are, while the Soul King is both incapable of expressing himself singularly, yet inherently above that aforementioned approach to transcendence. Reo is transcendent as his form of expression is found in the form of completely separate entities from himself. And the brilliance of this doesn't come in the form of just his limbs and organs, the various characters who contain literal pieces of him within them, but rather it comes from every single soul in the cosmos as they are all inextricably linked to the Reo as the cornerstone. All of them are connected to the Soul King, whether they know of his existence or otherwise. Because the nature of life, or rather spiritual existence within Bleach, the circulation of souls, the separate races, are all a product of the Soul King's influence over the world. He is the cornerstone, the literal root of it all. Without him, the world as it currently has been for a million years, reality as they perceive it, would be completely different on a fundamental level. The very makeup of their existence would not be the same. 
And by examining the plight of characters and their respective races, we can see how the very nature of the world is crucial to each of their ideologies. Noitere and Grimjow are good examples for the Hollows. They are shackled by the Menos condition, an endless cycle of consumption and suffering. Rukia and Renji for the Shinigami, who both submit to what is expected of them as cogs in the machine that is the conformist aristocratic soul society. Uryu and even Yugaram for the Quincy, who also submit to what is expected of them by their almighty father. And again, at the root of it all is the Soul King whose existence is the backbone of all these different societies. To transcend, these characters must evolve beyond their inherent surroundings through individual expression. Nell is a perfect example for the Hollows. She is an anomaly to the Menos condition as she values life over anything else and shows compassion. She has broken free from endless consumption and embraced reason as a rational being. Both Renji and Rukia transcend by accepting their individuality, conquering their fears and embracing them themselves wholly, breaking free from what is expected of them within their inherent societies. And of course, Uryu goes against his prophesied position as the Prince of Light and fights for his own ideals, for his friends, alongside the Shinigami he once detested. And this is all complemented by the existence of the Soul King. While individual entities express themselves through reason and self-actualization, the Soul King transcends past the idea of the self and in turn the idea of self-expression, residing at the highest point of transcendence and expressing himself through the very idea of life itself. Things exist because the Soul King does, and the Soul King exists because things do. Everything in existence is an aspect of him, and he is an aspect of everything that exists. It is a preordained harmony that cannot be broken by virtue of the nature of existence itself. He is one with the world, as the universe is a soul pantheism, the all-encompassing imminent God present in absolutely everything, without the ability to express any will of his own. One could even argue that the very definition of the word courage, the thesis of this story and every thematic idea that goes into deliberating that ultimate message is the Soul King's manner of expression and self. It is by virtue of his existence that every protagonist is able to transcend and overcome their existential fears, as he is the root of those fears. The very themes of the story are enabled by Reo, and funnily enough, this incapacity to express himself as an individual is the furthest thing from everything Bleach advocates for. Kubo robs the Soul King's need for all the things that those he presides over require to live. Nourishment, health, sense, and thought. And he frees him for the ever-present struggle that the rest of existence must grapple with, the finite, life and death. The Soul King's sustenance comes in the form of spiritual existence, as if the Reo is an inversion of his own creations. All life except the Soul King require physical sustenance to survive, but their souls, their spiritual existence, requires enlightenment to reach that next step. By being granted the conscious capability of chasing after transcendence, they are all far more capable of reaching perfection than the Soul King could ever be. He lacks the fundamentals of the human condition while representing the pinnacle of spiritual existence. And through chasing after spiritual enlightenment, all of existence inherently partakes in the march of courage that is Bleach's entire thematic crux to live through struggle in hopes of achieving spiritual evolution. Reo can never chase anything higher than himself because what he requires physically is what they require spiritually. And he can never chase what they require because he's a being who's been robbed of the capacity to even consider that. That is the contradictory existence of the being at the highest most point in the world, incapable of expressing himself yet through his power the perfect breeding ground for everybody else to express themselves is formed. By serving as this perfect being who exists above the soul society, above the heavens, Kubo intends to evoke feelings of utter transcendence. This is the closest thing to a god in the world of Bleach, yet he is inherently imperfect, not just because of the nature of his existence or the fact that he's missing limbs and has no agency, but because so much of Kubo's ideological beliefs are inherently against this existence. The height of courage, and thus the height of life, is being human, and is expressing oneself in the human manners presented to us, to keep moving forward even without a form. So by transcending past human expression, the Soul King is the most flawed being in the universe while also being its pinnacle. The best way to explain would be by taking a closer look at the second most quote-unquote godly existence in the story, the son of the Soul King, Yuhabar himself, the one who loathes his father's current existence whilst also feeling a clear inferiority toward him, in part because of the way Yuhaba finds value in authoritative figures by the nature in which others give themselves spiritually to their leaders. 
which despite being the most transcendent being, the Soul King is the complete antithesis of. Yuhaba, in the most negative yet human way possible, finds his own worth based on the singular expression he takes from his children, by becoming one with them, placing himself in the depths of their soul and sharing in their blood. The Quincy give to Yuhaba, whilst the Shinigami took from the Soul King. And on that line of thinking, one could easily say that Yuhaba is more perfect than the Soul King ever was because of the simple fact that he is a flawed, singular being that retained the capacity to express himself through words and actions. And of course, the fact he is defined by the human fear to lose that expression in death. Whereas the Soul King, like a senseless figurehead, simply accepted his role to be devolved into a keystone without even fighting for his life. This is all further substantiated by Yuhaba's fate at the end of the story when he is forced to assume the role of the Soul King as the senseless cornerstone. We can even apply this line of thinking to Aizen in so many ways. He finds worth in how the Espada pledge loyalty and even their identities to him, literally having their ideological stances and reason for existence being defined by Aizen's expression of standing as the fearless one. He is born from the fear of hollows as he walks the path of fearlessness. It all ultimately boils down to the nature of expression in the most barebone sense the line between expressing oneself as a singular individual or as a fearful cog in a machine who simply does as is expected of them. After all, Bleach is a story fundamentally designed by institution, law, and setting. The entire Soul Society arc is predicated on Ichigo's strong moral convictions, which spur him on to fight against the law of a holy land. Hueco Mundo explores Aizen society, characterized by fear and endless suffering, and ultimately the Thousand Year Blood War combines all of these ideas and explores the design of the entire cosmos. In every single arc and every single realm, you will find characters who give themselves to the institutions present in their surroundings. Yamamoto and Byakuya wholly give themselves to the conformist soul society. Rukia gives herself to the same society out of loneliness and grief. Noitara succumbs to the hollow condition out of short-sightedness. Renji barked at the moon and failed to do anything about his desires, out of fear that he didn't have what it takes to stand against the likes of Byakuya. All of these characters essentially have hand off their capacity for self-expression to the general idea of government and institution and by extension the Soul King himself as the cornerstone of the cosmos, with the only character this never really applies to being none other than Ichigo, the substitute Soul Reaper who exists outside of these fixed governmental institutions. Instead, Ichigo's way of life is derivative of a set of institutions with self-imposed measures, like family and kinship. His relationship with his parents especially serve as his own cornerstone that he grapples with throughout the series, coming to his own terms with Masaki's death, essentially serving as the springboard to his enlightenment, whilst others find themselves adhering to institutions that are made for them by proxy through the existence of government societies and other systems, Ichigo adheres to his own conceptions of institution through self-made interpersonal relationships. He is the author of his own fate, so to speak, despite having his life's events controlled by the likes of Aizen and Yuhaba, who themselves are shackled by this idea of conforming to the will of others. The discrepancy between acting upon the Soul King's will, which is what the Shinigami have been indoctrinated into believing, and the Soul King's actual nature and incapacity to express his own will, complements the general commentary present in Bleach. Everybody in the world is waiting for a saviour who cannot even walk towards them, and in the process they forget that they themselves have legs. The natural step here would be to not project the properties you think a saviour should have onto a being, but rather to internalise those properties by adorning yourself with all the things you wish for. Nobody's gonna conquer your fears but yourself, you are the only person who can save yourself. An analogy Kubo formulated in the final volume poem and sketches. As the grains of sand Yuhaba likens to fate itself are repeatedly cut down by Ichigo who ultimately shatters fate, conquering despair by stepping forward. Even without a form, we will never stop walking. These are the stories of Brave, with Ichigo as the ultimate ideal. The personification of courage in the face of death, exerting his will as a formless strength, a strength that lies beyond the scope of the material world, a strength that can only be achieved through intimate knowledge of oneself, and the resolve to stay true to the self, completely removed from any government or institution. Ichigo lives by his own code, and through his unshakable resolve and strong moral convictions, he greatly affects those institutions around him. Perhaps that is why the Soul King allowed the ancestors to mutilate him. Perhaps he saw a boy in the distant future, emblematic of everything the world needs.
The Soul King is so incredibly dense that it's hard to even put thoughts on him into words, let alone a coherent, cohesive script that encompasses all the key points of his existence. Writing this script was absolute hell because practically everything I spoke of today cannot be found in the text. It is deeply, deeply rooted in subtle subtextual implications. But at the same time, that's the beauty of this character. The ambiguity of his writing is exactly what enables so much density. If the Soul King were any more clearly defined, it would simply not suffice as a vessel for every single one of these ideas. With that being said though, we have reached 10k words in this script and I think I've covered enough of the most important aspects of the Soul King. If you have anything to add, please do in the comment section down below and thank you very much for watching.